So hello, welcome anyone. My name is Kun Khoi and the title of my talk is Are Embedded Build Systems Still Needed? And before you say, hey, isn't there a law about that? Yes. So are embedded build systems still needed? And there's a multiple choice answer there and hopefully at the end of the presentation you can fill this in for your specific use case. If you've ever attended one of my talks before and you'll notice that I run through the slides in like 10 minutes and then go to the questions section. It would be nice if you can now do the questions earlier. So if you have a question, uh, stand up and state your question in the microphone or speak loud and I'll repeat the question and I'll try to answer it. And uh, if you want to read along with the slides, go to this tiny URL that points to this Google Doc. So this is how I got suckered into embedded Linux. Around 2002, I bought a PDA and it was awesome. It had Bluetooth and a touchscreen. A touchscreen, touch yes. <laughs> and it had both uh, compact flash and SD card slot. And, and it was fine, but um, it even had NAND flash, but... But it had Flash, but Windows CE did not use Flash. That was for the operating system. Everything was stored in uh, the RAM. Basically, Windows CE was a big RAM disk. So if you ran out of battery, um, that ended up as a basic reinstall. Including the, oh, you have a touchscreen now. Let's go practice. And you have to go through the setup routine. And that was tedious. And then someone said, well, you can install Linux on PDA. So I was like, that's pretty cool. So I tried to research it and it turns out people were trying to port Linux to the uh, HP IPAC 2210. Like, ah, this will be easy. But it turns out that Linux on IPACs worked well for the older models, the strong arm models, and this one was work in progress. They said, well, just download our kernel from CVS. It was like, what, what CVS? Downloaded the kernel. And I'm like, now what? I, I build it, but how do I install it? And then someone said, well, you have to actually cross-compile it. And I'm like, cross-compiling, what are you talking about? And along the way, I discovered that ARM is really special and you need to do things differently. And then people said, we're now going to use this newfangled thing, Open Embedded. Chris Larson just created it a month ago. It will be awesome. We will switch to it. So I tried it out and I could build things and along the way, um, I bought a second PDA and all the model that could run Linux, so it could test things in case this would ever run Linux. That's how things start. And it was like, well, it's working pretty well. I can do my appointments, I can do audio recording, and, uh, but this hasn't been released. The familiar Linux distribution hasn't seen a release for over a year. Why? They said, well, if someone would volunteer to be a release manager, we could do a release. I said, oh, why doesn't someone do that? And they said, you just did. <laughs> so with zero experience, I became a release manager. So that's how I got suckered into embedded Linux. So this is the early 2000s. The PDAs, they had 32 megs of RAM, 64 megs of RAM. Uh, I think the one just shown even had a 128 meg version. That was, well, wow, how much RAM will you ever need? It had tiny flash and you could have MMC or compact flash slots. The IPEC 3600 had no SD card slot. You could put in a big jacket and you got big ass PCMCA and you could use micro drives and things like that, but it was cumbersome and then you ended up with basically an 80 cell phone. So, which groups in this period need a build system? The users, they don't. If they download something, they download the firmware image, they flash it over serial, and there's not much you really you can do with it. You just have enough NAND left to store basically a year worth of appointments in your calendar. Uh, 
you don't have a camera or something like that. So there's not, not much you can do with your PDA. Um, for the people that had a large PDA with an SD card, you could install extra packages, but because the screen was tiny, it was a touch screen, you didn't have a keyboard, every application you had needed to get customized. And as it turned out, every customized application was already built and prepackaged for you. So the users, they didn't even know what a build system was. They just used your distribution. For application developers, they had to use it. There weren't any SDKs available, no on-target tool chains, and well, no, just generic tool chains were available. You could do cross tool, that might work, might not work. You could do build root, which might work, might not work. So basically you needed a build system. And the distro developers, they needed it because open embedded and build root were the only way to do a distribution. And along the way, familiar open source and open simpad decided that they wanted to do A, support a bunch of different machines and B, support package management. So build root was a complete fail for that and they created something new, open embedded. As you might notice, in that period, it was really hip to call something open. <laughs> and what build systems did we have available? There was an IPAC cluster at HP that was IPAX with the PCMCA sleeves and Debian installed on a hard drive with networking access. You could SSH in and around 2002, one or two were working. They ran an ancient version of Debian for ARM uh, with even older compilers. You, all you had was GCC 2.95.3 and that's it. It didn't run actually any distribution provided by handhelds.org. So if you want to de develop for a different distribution, you just couldn't. You were tied to old compilers, old C libraries. At this point, it was basically useless. Build root, that worked fine, except it didn't scale for lots of different targets. You ended up with just n copies of your build root config instead of just small changes to your machine description. So that didn't scale. And Chris Larson said, I can do this on company time. I hate Monte Vista at work. I hate build root in my spare time. I will create something new. And that's how Open Embedded started. And Open Embedded at that time, we had a lively IRC community where we would pass our local.conf into pastebins and things like that because you needed the magic options to make it work. I think Tim Bird can testify that you needed a lot of magic options to make it actually work. So, no one was happy. There was close co cooperation between application developers like GPE and OP, specific palm top environments and the distro people. The distro people worked closely together because everyone was doing all those roles. If you were an application developer, you had to be a build system developer and you had to be a distro developer just to be able to see your application on the screen. Which does mean that there is a very tight integration so your software runs as expected. Nowadays when you uh, install a distribution on your computer or on your laptop, you can say, oh, I really hate this GNOME desktop. And then someone will step up and say, well, in upstream GNOME, everything is okay. But the tweaks Fedora, OpenSUSE or whatever do to it, those are the things you hate. And you get the big discussion of distro specific patches and things like that. Those didn't exist in that day. So life was good for the very few people who were working on it. And at that time there were like 20 people. So a while later, TI released the Beagle board. It was massively more powerful than anything on the market. It was the first Cortex-A8 device available. It had a floating point processor. It even had two. You could do vector floating point on it and sim instructions and it was cheap. It was, I forget, $200 on launch or something. That was a lot cheaper than the $3,000 that you could get. So what did that mean? You got a lot of RAM, you had an SD card for storage and you could actually use networking. And that was the start of the problems for build systems. So users were still like, they didn't need 
a build system. They finally had gigabytes of storage. They used everything from package feeds because they were like, oh, I can finally install things on it. They were just so happy with that. Application developers got slightly grumpy because they were finally used to having working SDKs, but for the bigger board, there was a flaky SDK available, which didn't really work. It was something that we said, oh, open embedded can generate SDKs. We'll just build the SDK, upload it, and we'll see what happens. Well, it was broken. The on-target toolchain didn't really work, and the external toolchain, it turns out, only works if you had the exact same distribution as the toolchain was built on. Which, in my case, was everybody was locked to an ancient version of Debian. And the distro developers, they of course needed it because there was still no other way to build a complete uh, distribution from scratch in a reasonable time frame. And the build systems, there were a few more available. Well, open about it, still around. The Angstrom config worked. You had 32 distribution configs. And I, look, I went back, I said more than 90%, three of the distribution configs worked. The 29 other configs just didn't work for one reason or another. So that doesn't inspire a lot of confidence. Uh, you had Gen2 prefix that worked extremely well, but virtually no one knows about it, still don't, doesn't. Gen2 prefix basically means you say, I now want to build for ARM, and Gen2 will build for ARM in a root using the Gen2 metadata, and it just works. So you don't have to run Gen2 on your target, it cross compiles for you. Why people don't know about it, I don't know, but at that time it worked very well. The problem was that uh, no toolchain supported EABI. You had to patch your toolchain. The code sorcery toolchains, um, yeah, I've said enough about that, but they didn't work. You had to patch them. You get, had to get bribe someone with a code sorcery subscription to get the patch to make the toolchain actually work. So once that patch was out in the open, you could basically build it, and that's how we got Open Embedded to work and Gen2. And finally, you could do ARM EBI with all the nice ARM Cortex A8 stuff, but but still, uh, if you want to do cross compiling, was open better than Gen 2. The rest was native compilation, and since the Beagle board was new, native compilation was on all the hardware. For example, Debian used NSLU 2s, which is a four no sorry 266 megahertz ARM 9, and anything you wanted to build on it, it took at least two weeks because pretty much everything depends on NSS or NSPR, which is part of Firefox, which takes two weeks to build because swap is on a USB hard disk. So anything you did two week timeout, native builds, they, they didn't really scale. But if you just add enough NSLE 2s and go away in six months approximately, you could build the Debian archive. That's what Leonard Buitenhek did. He used an Angstrom tool chain to build the first Debian EABI support and it took him six months on really fast hardware. That's how Debian got started. So that isn't really an option for a distribution. Uh, at that time, with the build box on university, which had multiple CPUs, etc., I could build a file system image for the Beagle board, which got a GNOME desktop in approximately three days. So that's still quite slow, but that's manageable if you do it from, from scratch. That's not the six months it would take on Debian with a build farm. People got unhappier in this situation, strangely enough. No co co cooperation between app developers anymore because GNOME, KDE, etc. only cared about real life computers, like they said, where you could just have a GPU with OpenGL and tons of RAM. Uh, distro people and build system people, they didn't really work together because big distros do native builds, so you don't have to talk to the build system people, you just maintain your package as usual and then at one point the auto builder will kick out the package for your architecture. And even worse, users suspect Red Hat Enterprise Linux type of stability with Gentoo style optimization and Debian wealth of pre-built packages from your distribution, which at that point was still managed by people in their spare time. But the bigger bone had blinking LEDs. So 
users were still happy. They were grumbling about, oh, this doesn't work, that doesn't work. But at the end of the day, they could blink their LEDs and then they were, they were happy. <laughs> Can you spell bit banging? At that point, th there wasn't any bit banging going on yet. Because you didn't really have the on-target tool chain. So if you want to develop your own application, you had to do it in Python or something. And that didn't know about GPIOs yet. So fast forward, and it's the, the time of the RG, Arduino and Raspberry Pi. Uh, this is not an Arduino and a Raspberry Pi. The big red thing is a Sanguino. That's basically an Arduino on steroids. People who know about 3D printing community, that's the controller of the original wooden maker bot. And that plexiglass thing, that is the plexiglass version of an original wooden maker bot, but now driven by a BeagleBone. So that was my hobby project, convert all the Arduinos into Beagle Bones, and it worked. I can't say it's better than the Arduino, but at least it runs Linux now. <laughs> so that's suddenly a completely different market. The original Beagle board was sent out to developers who wanted to develop on the brand spanking new OMAP3 Cortex A8 because it was the only way to get your hands on that type of hardware. It was a strange situation that TR was actually funding their competitors because people would buy a bigger board, implement their software, and then buy the Freescale CPU for their design. But we would still sell bigger boards. And with the BeagleBone, we wanted to go to the maker community right at the point that the Arduino was very popular and the Raspberry Pi. So the use, what the users wanted to do, they wanted to interface sensors, motors, their electronic cat feeder, etc., to your board. And in Arduino, they were used to just, if you need a protocol, you bit bang it. They get your board and they go like, oh, that's weird, you don't have an IDE where I just click upload. And they're like, yeah, but, but you can use a shell script and sysfs to twiggle a pin. And they're like, oh, yeah, I can do that, I can blink an LED. And then a week later they come back with, but if I use a shell script and the system entries for GPIO, I can only get like two kilohertz out of the pin for my thing. And I need 200 kilohertz. And we're like, what are you doing? That needs a kernel module. And I go like, yeah, but we're not programmers. So with people moving to scripting languages, hardware becoming available, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera less and less people actually need a build system. And we started getting jokes about ethical compilation because at one Ubuntu developer uh, summit, one person said cross-compiling is fundamentally broken and another one meant, said it was something unethical. So <laughs> that's what we stuck with. So ethical builds. Uh, in the embedded space, Angstrom and then Pokey and the open embedded distros are basically based the only cross-compiled distributions. Uh, build root is not really used by distributions, more for one-off things like medical or uh, industrial units. Uh, Ubuntu runs on it, Fedora now runs on ARM, OpenSUSE runs on ARM, Gentoo has a native ARM port, Arch Linux has a native ARM port. Basically, any distribution worth its salt has a native ARM port. And will have a port for the Raspberry Pi, the BeagleBone, BeagleBoard, OneBoard, QB board, Arndale board. You get the picture. There are a lot of boards around there now. So trying to get people interested in build systems is really, really, really hard nowadays. Uh, we locked out Yocto. Yocto became popular. Intel started funding Yocto and started saying like, oh, this virtualization team in China, all 60 people are now build system engineers. And that is basically one of the great leap forward that thanks to Yocto, people are now paid to work on open embedded because all the hobby users that were there from the start are now paid to work on it. We have very, very, very few volunteers left because uh, all the fun stuff has been done. And if you want to get work done, Install Ubuntu on your dev development board. And you run into quotes like this. So 
The first quote is, I disabled USB in a kernel to make it boot faster. Users that want USB can easily reconfigure and rebuild the kernel because the kernel is using the Yocto kernel tooling. So this was for an Intel based board and Intel marketing was saying, this is the Intel architecture advantage. Stuff just runs. It's not special anymore like that creepy arm. So I said, people buy that board, hook up their monitor, power it up. Ah, that's stuff on a monitor. Plug in a keyboard mouse, it doesn't work. Strange. You go like online, like, yeah, you need to rebuild the kernel. Like, yeah, we can do that. I rebuild the kernel from a laptop. And then it shoot up. Like, no, 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 you cannot rebuild the kernel the way you want. You have to install this open embedded and then build everything, including the tool chain. And on top of that, you cannot reconfigure the kernel because we use the Jocto kernel tooling. And no bad word about Jocto kernel tooling. It's great because it scales to a lot of boards, but if you're just interested in your board, it's a learning curve. At that point, the marketing lady blew a gasket and said we should stop being stupid and just turn on USB. <laughs> so we could have lured people into the build system, but we soon realized if we would pull stunts like this, uh, people would go like, doesn't work, Google, oh, I can install Ubuntu and they would install Ubuntu it, and we still wouldn't have people, only pissed them off even more. And the next quote, this is from a build root developer in 2006. We don't support X11 because we're embedded and not bloated. And then five years later, we support 11, we're so awesome. <laughs> the team has changed in the, in the meantime. Yes. <laughs> wait, wait. You, you promised not to name the build system. <laughs> no, but then they said the maintainers left and they got new maintainers, so it's like, I won't insult them, so. Uh, so you're doing them a favor by uh, uh, that the new maintainers can say the old maintainers were stupid? Yes. Oh, okay. Because, well, the, the other problem was that basically you need to have a really strong will to be a build system developer and in, in regular terms you basically needed to be an asshole to be a build system developer and that it's not, <laughs> let, not yeah, it's, and open source developers is like herding cats, you, it's just impossible to get something done by consensus and uh, yeah, the build group people were like UC Lipsy, we're embedded and all that open embedded, they're, they're weird. But nowadays build group supports basically anything, so more power to them. And you get, this is not really build system related, but it's, someone said to me, well, I made this device tree and it makes supporting this platform so much easier. So I said, well, it's a derivative of this board. So just send me the device tree I include and it will work out of the box. And he goes like, but why, why would I do that? The point is it's external to the kernel, so it should never go upstream. And it's just, so I just, grabbed it and added it to my build system. So it's not upstream in the kernel, but stuff now works out of the box. And this is a question I get very often. Should I switch from using Open Embedded to using Yocto? And um, I went to the keynote this morning and it confused the heck out of me. <laughs> because I always learned that Yocto was this umbrella project and Open Embedded was the build system and the people on stage kept saying building with Yocto. So, I don't know what's going on anymore, and that should attract more and more users. Uh, the answer to this question, uh, Open Embedded is part of the Yocto project. So if you use Open Embedded, you use Yocto. And uh, the real kicker, one of the biggest uh, Yocto and Open Embedded users nowadays, thanks software, Open Embedded is just a single script that only supports one thing. So like I said, people in build systems were jerks. So do you have any questions? I'm also open to Yocto and Open Embedded questions if you want to uh, hear about that. <laughs> question just <to> live. <laughs> question, could you come forward and speak into the, the microphone? Ah. So, uh, <laughs> the fact that I'm walking up here might preempt the question. Do you have a conclusion at the end there? <laughs> So the conclusion is, um, 
it's it's a cop out. It it's depend, but for the last users don't need need it. You need to be in a very specific situation that you need an embedded build system because for most things nowadays your distro takes care of it. You only need to be a package developer. Uh, the people at ARM said, oh, we're doing our BSP now for the Chromebook. Do we need a build system? Because we have this use case. And they're like, yeah, in that case, you need a build system because they wanted to be ahead of the curve. They wanted to test Wayland and Murr and things like that. So like, yeah, you need a build system. But the people you're delivering this to, they don't because they integrate it in their distribution. It's not needed anymore. Disclaimer, I'm a build root contributor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. um, there are cases where an embedded build system are still useful. For example, if I just install Raspbian on my Raspberry Pi, it takes roughly 45 seconds, one minute to boot up to the desktop screen, which I do not need. I just want to run uh, a single daemon TV add-on that records the TV USB and streams it in my home. Building mm -hmm. it with, uh, okay, build root, but React or whatever, uh, open with it. Um, but in three seconds, without optimizations at all. Yes. So we just still need cases where we can tweak the, the file system, the target of file yes. system. Yes. So with, with embedded build system, that it allows you to build things from the ground up. And you have a few edge, edge cases, like, uh, I guess, AVR32. Uh, Sadly, it's a dead architecture now. It's been, it's been end of line. Uh, but all the developer board you would get had eight max of RAM. So you cannot do any native development for it. It had no QEMU available for it. So anytime someone says, just build it natively, you would just want to reach out through the internet and punch them because <laughs> there's no way to do that. Could you, or pass the microphone back there? That's also an option. What? One thing to note that Chris, uh, who was originally developed OE, mm -hmm. was actually fired from TI for spending all his time working on OE. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a small fact. It's, they actually made a Mark II of the Network Gateway with 128 megs of RAM. Ah. And there was, for a short period, actually a build farm building Debian. with 10 of those. Yeah, and that, that it I had almost completed. I had an AVR32 where well, Leon Wustenberg kindly replaced, uh, manually replaced the, the 8 Mac chip with a 32 Mac chip. So in theory, I could have done a native build uh, as well on that. But at that point, it wasn't really feasible. And um, ARM64, there's no hardware available yet. So the company that has been the most hostile to uh, open embedded ARM Limited they would invent new build system just to avoid using open embed. It finally went like, we have a problem. There is no publicly available emulator for it, no simulator, and no hardware. But we need to bring up the software because we want the server people to be able to use it. So what the hell do we do? And luckily, Linaro said, well, there's this thing called Open Embedded that can do cross compilation. And Arm said, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, and Linaro, we're now bringing up, uh, the original bring up was with Open Embedded, and there are now simulators available freely downloadable from the Arm website. So you can just go the Gen 2 route and Debian route and do native compilation. But for bring up on a new architecture, you need cross-compilation, and as, as soon as you're in that position, you need an embedded build system because it's just too hard to do it yourself. And I think Tim confessed that his do-it-yourself build system wasn't completely DIY, but heavily <laughs> leaning on Monte Vista. <laughs> well, there were several do-it-yourself build systems at Sony, and, but the one that we recently converted over from was actually a Monte Vista driven. Right. And, and while Montevista was great, it basically was you have this big file system and you can cut it down to your needs and mostly you want to build it up. So that's where open and better than built would shine. You go like, I want this and only this and that's what you get. So, more questions. Um, yeah, another issue with native compilation. Mm -hmm. um, there is a Arch Linux R. 
It has a lot of package, but no Firefox. <coughs> and um, I asked, they told, they told me, we can't build it. Why? Guess why? Not enough RAM on yes. the build server. So yes. So th that, that not enough RAM on the build server, that is a fairly recent uh, problem that, for example, the final link stage of WebKit requires approximately three gigs of RAM. So, uh, yeah, you, you can add a lot of swap, that doesn't always work, and various architectures don't allow the, the complete four gigabyte, and you run into a lot of problems. Um, I've heard that LLVM will solve this, but that's still a bit away. If you compile the x86 64-bit kernel uh, with full options turned on, it requires 9 gig for the link stage with, with uh, link time optimization turned on. So 9 gig for the final link stage for an x86 kernel. So, <laughs> uh, well, x86 is not really what I would call embedded, but it shows that <laughs> modern software requires a ton of RAM. So uh, native compilation is not always an option unless you have oodles and oodles of time and my guess is that a lot of people go like we're consultants we get paid by the hour <laughs> we will do native compilation and then sometimes it, it's it's easier uh, I I must confess nowadays I prototype for native compilation especially for things like Perl modules uh, someone said I want to use this piece of software and I looked at it it uses WX widgets which are horrible to cross build and even worse, it uses the Perl version of the WX widgets. So I looked at it and went like, you know what? I'm going to install Perl on the target first and use CPAN to build everything. Five hours later, uh, it halted somewhere halfway because I had run out of RAM. And I spent a few weeks doing integrating WX into Open Embedded and I finally have it working and you can build it in 10 minutes or so. so Future generations will be able to build WX in like 10 minutes or install it from the binary package feeds because still native development is not really an option on the other ARM platforms. Questions? No one has mentioned OpenGL yet. What, what's the next corner case? What's the next corner case? Well, there isn't one in the slides, but there are a few um, more corner cases uh, which are coming up again because there's also a big engine version of ARM64 coming and it uses a weird target tablet. It ends in BE instead of EB, so we have to patch a lot of build systems for the big engine detection nowadays. Because um, even the Linux kernel, you say, I'm an ARM big engine, I want to build big engine, and it builds and builds and builds and builds and gives you something and uh, well internally people said ah it builds success and I integrated the kernel into open embedded and open embedded says uh, that's a little in the a binary um, error so there's a long road to go for weirdly named architectures and uh, with build systems you're, you are able to spot such errors that it's actually building little endian instead of big endian binaries or what we notice in Open Embedded after we uh, finally added architecture checks that for approximately six years we built the point-to-point uh, -point daemon PPPD as an x86 binary for all architectures and installed it into ARM file systems. No one ever noticed it. So if there are no more questions, remarks, then thank you for listening. And see you next year.